So first of all, what we're going to cover today is really, we'll start with the bad news, the decline of the monarch. Um, and in order to understand, the, understand that, I'm going to give you a, just a brief overview of their life cycle, of the various generations, and of that amazing migration that they do. Um, then we'll talk about native milkweed in Utah, because there, there's many more than you think, and nectar sources that the butterflies need, and then how you can help. Okay, so here is the bad news. Now, when we talk about monarchs, we really talk about those that are west of the Rockies and those that are east of the Rockies. And they're actually the same species. It just happens that the Rocky Mountains make a nice dividing line where most of the group goes to Mexico. And on our side, most of the group goes to the California coast for their overwintering sites. But if you look at where we started back in 1980 tracking the monarchs, in the western part of the, the nation, we had about four and a half million. And over time, you can see the number decrease, the number decrease. About this time in 2016, 17, I was visiting the California sites in the winter and seeing, you know, a couple of hundred thousand monarchs. Two years ago, that dropped down to just less than 30,000. And we just got the numbers in from the winter count west of the Rockies, and we've gone down to 1,900. So dropped 99.9% during that time. It's kind of a similar picture east of the Rockies. This is a the graph that just kind of shows you that there's some natural variation over the years, bend, depending on weather and such. But overall, the entire, the majority of the population is, is headed not in a good direction. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit. So the, the, there are various, causes of design, much of which is we have just plain built up, um, developed, and we have no more, you know, all this agricultural land that used to grow milkweed along the ditch banks is no longer there. Um, if you look at, if you were here in the Salt Lake Valley, uh, you know, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, it was open fields and it's now wall to wall, you know, roads, homes, developments, commercial. Also the timing of, the introduction of products like Roundup happened to coincide with the decline in the monarchs. And as you know, that they are de designed so that they would kill weeds, but leave certain other products like, you know, the corn in the field. So farmers doing the, what they need to do, spray it, kills the milkweed, leaves the corn, and that leaves nothing for the monarchs because if, You'll learn in a second, monarchs have to have milkweed. It's the only food for the caterpillars. The other alarming thing is, and this is a new graph that's been just put in by Monarch Watch, is truly climate change. The red part in the West is saying that, you know, we're increasing in temperature about 0.7 degrees per decade. So if you look over that 40 years, I mean, that's enough to start changing things where monarchs move, and I'll explain this in a minute, but monarchs move inward from their overwintering site to find milkweed too soon because it's warm and the milkweed isn't there uh, and all sorts of related things. And then you have the freak storms like this, which was three years ago in the heart of Mexico, those big where they overwinter down in Mexico. And a storm came through right before they were going to migrate north, literally broke the trees and killed like 30% of the monarchs. So just freak, freak storms that might be climate related. So they've got a lot working against them. And just this past December, after six years of study, the monarch, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife determined that, yes, indeed, the monarch does deserve to be listed under the endangered species list, um, which just breaks my heart. Uh, the problem is they call it, they say it's precluded because we have so many other species waiting on the list. They don't have enough resources to do what they need to do to help them. So in the meantime, it's up to us. So in order to, for us to help, we need to know you know, enough about them to know where things are going wrong. So if, I'm going to take you back to third grade here. So here's the life cycle of the monarch. So you've got the adult that flies in. She lays an egg only on milkweed because remember, once it hatches, 
that's the only plant that the milkweed, or excuse me, that the caterpillar can eat. So, you know, three to five days, that egg is there. Well, in three to five days, 95% of those eggs get eaten by predators, ants, spiders, beetles, and that's not part of the overall decline. That's just, that's the way it's been forever. That's why monarchs lay, you know, four to 500 eggs each, and they spread them over all the plants because they don't put more than one per leaf. So you three to five days, the egg, if that makes it, that little devil hatches. Um, it's a caterpillar for 11 to 18 days. It grows 2,000% just eating milkweed and only milkweed. Then it makes that beautiful green chrysalis with the gold um, jewelry on it. Um, that's another 18, 8 to 14 days. So in the heat of the summer, this whole thing happens in three weeks. On the shoulder, uh, seasons, you know, cooler spring, and in the fall it takes longer. The colder it is, the longer the whole process is. But just remember that's that's the, uh, the, the what it goes through. So here's just a quick journey through this. The female comes in, she finds milkweed, um, which she can smell when they get close enough, and then they land on it and can tell by their feet. They have sensors that can tell how healthy the plant is, and so they will look for the newest, most tender shoots, she curls up, lays a little egg underneath there. That egg looks like, I could look, think of it as a, a kind of a yellow football. And this is, you know, pretty magnified, obviously, but here it is in my hand, and you can see them on, on the leaf. Now, if you were to look at the back of any milkweed leaf, you'd probably see lots of little white drops. And that is from the, the latex that's in the, the veins, the actual milk for the milkweed. But it's much wider than what you see here. You can, you'll notice it's kind of yellow. And that's if you're ever looking out there, that's the way to tell the difference. So here's one that's just getting ready to hatch. The little black head has create, has, you know, it goes from being totally yellow to having that dark head. And this is a one hour old. And I, I've put the pin there to kind of give you a sense of how tiny they are. And they are a legal game for all sorts of bugs and birds because they haven't really eaten enough milkweed to get toxic yet. And so these guys um, continue to grow. Here, theirs is probably a couple of days later, and you'll notice they can only eat the top of the milkweed. So if you're out in plants, you notice that just something funny is just eaten off the top, you know it's been a baby. And you probably see little signs of frass or poop caterpillar poop, and that's what they do for two weeks now, is they're going to eat and poop and eat and poop. Um, here is a leaf that has all, all of these caterpillars are under a week old. And you, so you can see how much they grow from just this little size, you know, over the course of days, you can almost see it. Um, but just, I, I was cleaning out a container, so I had to put them all on a leaf, and I mean, you can almost see it. Here is the total picture. So you've got five stages or five instars to a monarch caterpillar, and that just means a molt in between. So this little guy grows, he molts, and he becomes a second instar. He molts, and he's into the third size. And there you can notice that these um, antenna, they're not really antennas, but um, they grow longer, and that's kind of how you can judge. And by the time they're to their to their final stage, they get they're 2,000% bigger, and they get ready to go find a place to connect up from their rear end, and then they hang in kind of a J shape. And that's, uh, we know that that's that they're within 24 hours or so of creating their chrysalis. And so you can find these all over. They, they don't necessarily stay on milkweed or where they've been when they're ready to do that. And, and another thing that I think is really interesting is I always thought that they spun something around them, but when you think about it, it's the final molt. So the caterpillar here just starts to split a skin and this really super soft jello, green jello, um, is what is underneath and the, and the outer shell just kind of crunches up and this is, it's wiggly. If you see it in time lapse, this process is just wiggly. They're back and forth and you end up with the chrysalis, which is very, very fragile for the first few hours. You don't want to bump it. If they drop, um, it can deform the, the caterpillar or the butterfly. Um, once it's hardened for a day or two, they can drop to the ground and they'll do just fine. But 
right now if you sliced that open it would look just like a green liquid so we've actually gone from this crazy caterpillar to totally just green liquid that happens to have everything in the perfect place uh, all the dna such that when she hatches you've got the beauty but here's a just some examples of they, they do wander off from their milkweed. Sometimes they stay with it. This one I rode past on my bicycle up Immigration Canyon and it was right there in the full sun. You know, they'll crawl off on your patio and go underneath patio chairs, fences. Um, I, sometimes you just never see them until you see something flying around um, that is the adult monarch. But so you got to kind of know that they'll disappear. Um, I have raised them because I do trainings and I was cleaning a container, but I just thought it was an interesting sight to see the jewelry here. And then once that they get 10 to 12 days old, the chrysalis will go black. And what appears to be going black is actually transparent and you can start to see the monarch through it. And you know that you're within hours of it. Um, e-closing is the proper term, but this will split open and, and the actual butterfly will start to come out. So this is when you want to set up your iPhone on a little uh, tripod or you want to hold it in your hand because this is the magic that that happens. Oh gosh, Sean, if that's not going to work, I'm going to be sad. Is, is the button not there for you to... It is not, and I tested it right before we start. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Because this is a, so I was showing that this one comes out. It takes about sixty seconds. Dang it! Oh, there we go. There it goes. Yeah. And so we have, you know, this green caterpillar that has been contained for so long, all of a sudden breaks through, and it's just the most amazing. Amazing thing. And his head down, so what you're going to see is his head and then his little proboscis, the tongue, that is all curled up there. And you can see how furry they are. Okay, look at that fat belly. And then these perfectly little miniature wings. And you can see his, his tongue, the proboscis. And so what happens is they hang there for hours that first day. And as they're hanging, the fluid that's all in their belly is released into their wings and so that over the course of a couple of hours you know the wings start to extend and then they end up you know they've gone from this little perfect little origami monarch into this most beautiful creature and you can see this is left as a just a totally transparent chrysalis with that gold ring that we still don't understand um Rachel, that uh, video that we just watched about yes. how much time is that in in real life? That's one, it, that was real life. That was one. It was about a one minute for that thing to unfold once it's cracked. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I have way, way too many of them that are fun. That are so fun. But and then you know, so I take them. You give them twenty four hours. You take them outside because they they really have to cure, if you will. Uh, so you want them to be good and, and stable by the time you take them outside. And I put her on a butterfly bush and man, they just go to town. Um, I showed Sean a video yesterday that was pretty amazing. So here I'm going to back up and kind of just show you again. We refer to the monarchs of the West and then the monarchs of the East. They do have, you know, 90% of the population here. It's much more humid. And so to help you understand the whole big picture. So Monarchs arrive in Utah in May. They lay the first eggs here in May. That that generation, that first generation dies. And, and they stick around all summer long because really by the time they get here, what's driving them to migrate is the daylight, the length of day and the temperature. And really by the time you get to mid-June, we're almost at summer solstice. So they're not driven to go further. 
you know, some will, but we really have them from May through from, you know, May till the end of September. There are th four to five total generations per year. The lifespan of all of them, but one is about three to five weeks. The lifespan of the, the migrating generation is eight to nine months, which is crazy. And so I just want to give you an example by saying, let's say that here we are in Salt Lake and the monarch that hatches here in Salt Lake in September, they know because of the length of day, the temperature, the sun angle, that they are the migrating generation. And so they go into a what's called uh, diapause. So they're not a breeding generation. They're saving up their energy because they know they have to overwinter and there's no flowers, no pollen, you know, no nectar to get where they're going. And so they're relying on what they eat. So here in Salt Lake, we do have monarchs that will travel all the way down to central Mexico. We, but most of ours tend to go to the overwintering sites along the California coast. And there's a couple hundred sites there that are monitored. And so this is generation, let's see, this would be the eggs of the first generation are born here. So, okay, so here's the, the migrator comes to California. It takes maybe a couple of months to get there, two to three months to get here. They hang out for two to three months doing nothing but hanging in clumps, trying to stay warm enough. Um, if there's food, they would find it. They will try to find water, but really they're conserving their energy. So these guys are hanging in clumps along the coast in places that you can find. You get closer to spring, they know what's going on by again, they're triggered by daylight and temperature. They start heading inward to find milkweed. And that, so that generation gets halfway and one of those, that generation then makes it to Utah, lays eggs, another generation, another generation, and then the migrator starts over. So just to kind of give you an idea, one generation does the whole trip, eight or nine months, and the rest of them are really just kind of spending time moving further north where it's cool, cool enough to find more nectar and to find, you know, more fresh milkweed. But it's, it's amazing. It's kind of crazy how it all works out. So this was just as recent as four or five years ago. You can actually do a road trip and go to the Bay Area. Um, this is by Carmel Pacific Grove. And there's a little area of trees. The same trees are roped off every single year. And the monarchs that have never been there before come to the same trees. And they hang here together where they stay warm together. Um, we visited a number of sites. You know, Pismo Beach is the largest site. There were 30 or 40,000 monarchs there when we were there. Santa Cruz has two or three sites. There are a bunch. And then the group in Mexico um, is where the bulk of the monarchs really are. And I actually got to go there, I guess it's been two years now. This is a giant Oyamel fir tree with so many monarchs on it that the boughs are just weighed down. Um, if by chance you get there on a day that is warm enough, which is, means it's got to be at least 55 degrees or warmer, the monarchs were, will go out looking for water. So this is what happens and it's the most incredible thing. We were at 11,000 feet going on horseback. This is me over here. And this is kind of a, a natural pathway coming down the mountain where the monarchs had been. They were looking for water. So they had us get off the horses and we just laid on our backs and just watched this river of monarchs grow over us. And you wouldn't think that there was a shortage of monarchs. But if this is, you know, only 20% of what we used to have in, in Mexico, it was unbelievable. Um, and this is a, a real fun and inexpensive journey. I would highly recommend um, and quite a miracle. Hey, Rachel. Yeah. Um, there's a good question that's come up. You bet. Um, do you know how the monarchs actually find the spots to overwinter in? We don't know. And it's crazy because there are, I think there's 12 of these overwintering sites in the country of Mexico, all, in, you know, in the same general area. And they do move around a little bit. Four of those are open to the public, just four of them. Um, and they will shift each year a little bit, but generally it's the same group of trees. It's the same kind of trees. The trees are even being logged. So, I mean, there are all sorts of threats against them, but 
as much as we've studied, there's no real way to say, how do they know to go to these OML fir trees other than the sheer size of the trees where the trunks will retain heat because they're big enough. I mean, these are monster trees if you got up next to them. But just the fact that they return to the same spots or that, you know, here, that it, why would monarchs know to go back to Pacific Grove, the tiny little town of Pacific Grove to the same, these are Monterey Pines and eucalyptus trees on the same, it's the size of maybe three of the houses in my neighborhood, you know, combined. That's the size of this thing. And they hit the same trees every year. So it's, it's just mother nature. Yeah, it's just yeah, it's, that's amazing. Yeah. So now you know kind of the life cycle of them, the big migration, and there's all sorts of risk, obviously, on that migration where there's more studies being done right now. But let's talk about what they need to survive. So Utah, you probably think that this is the only milkweed that we have in the state. So this is what we refer to as showy milkweed. This is across from Hogle Zoo upon the hillside. And this is what we've seen on all of our ditch banks, you know, growing up in Lehigh and Cache Valley's full of it. And I was just in Boulder last weekend and there was a ton, Boulder, Utah, ton of it down there. But, but really, I pulled this just off iNaturalist and I went in and I said, show me every, um, you know, Asclepius observation in Utah last year. And these are all native species to Utah. I think there's one or two more that are missing, but our most common that we can use in Northern Utah are the showy one, which is very drought tolerant, one that we call swamp milkweed that is not drought tolerant, still can be used in your yard, but if you're going xeric, you don't want to use it, but it's different and um, blends in. Um, this antelope horns, this one is on the Bonneville shoreline trail. Uh, butterfly milkweed is on, is down in like St. George area natively, but it's bright orange and I have it in my yard and it's shocking. Um, this is the swamp one that I referred to, but I really just circled the ones that we use primarily because they're so easy to grow in northern Utah uh, are that. But there's, I mean, there's an amazing one. There's one like from the pink coral sand dunes. Uh, you just wouldn't recognize that these plants are even milkweed. So, so that, again, the caterpillars can only eat milkweed. Once it's a butterfly, it needs the nectar from the flowers, just like bees do and just like hummingbirds. And so there is a, a property, there's a horse property that's almost kind of a wetland area that's down in American Fork, you know, close to Utah Lake. So that's probably why the water. Here is the swamp milkweed mixed in with what might be sneezeweed. I don't know my flower, Sean, but, um, so you can just see how pretty it is and it's delicate, much more delicate than what we have in on the other. But all of this is down in this six acres of just a wetland horse property. And you can turn around 360 degrees and see monarchs every direction that you're looking. So this is all natural native. This is Joe pie weed. This is a vervain. I think this is a goldenrod. Uh, we've got an aster obviously sunflowers, but anything that a bee would use and a hummingbird would use, a monarch would love. And the more wide open the face, the easier it is for them to, to eat the nectar. So again, caterpillars need the milkweed, but after they're a butterfly, that's all they need is, is the nectar. I did, I just took a screen print of a document that really breaks out all of the different flowering plants and by season because monarchs need, the adult monarch needs the nectar as soon as she's here in May and all the way through to September. So this that's offered through Xeres, Xerces um, is a great list that you can see because here's the bloomers in the spring, here are summer ones, here's all the ones you can use in the summer to fall, here are the ones, you know, rabbit brush and um, just the different ones that stretch out because they really need it the whole season. And that's as critical to the monarch, the adult monarch as the milkweed is the rest of the year. And this document is a great one to find on Xerces website or I can provide it. Now, just to, um, to get in, I'm watching the time. Um, so for, for starting milkweed, you would think it would be just as easy as taking those seeds and tossing them out in the field. And obviously that works for mother nature, but you know why there's so many seeds in the pod because only a few of them will take. So we're just going to do a quick overview of, of when to collect them, 
what you might want to do, you know, what do you want in your yard, and what are your, what are your options. So first of all, you're going to recognize this is the showy milkweed, the seed pods that we see probably most frequently. Now that orange one that I showed you, the seed pod is different. It only has about 25 seeds. This one has 250. And this is another, uh, this is a narrow leaf milkweed. Again, another one that has just about 25 seeds. But they usually start ripening up, if you will, in late July and running through the end of the year. So it's, uh, you want to kind of keep that in mind. Now, you don't want to pull the seed pod before the seeds have turned brown. Otherwise, they will not ripen. If you pull a seed pod early and it's just whitish or light green seeds, those seeds are going to be worthless to you. So you really want to catch it right after that seam has broken and you can start to see that they've gone brown or you or you can go test it and just kind of peek into the break the seam and look. Um, some people put an elastic band around them. If you've ever been out hiking, you might see, you know, milkweed pods that have an elastic on it. And you know why? Because if you wait too long, the air dries it out and you have this explosion of seeds. And it's sure it's a lot easier to knock those seeds off with your thumb at this stage than it is to take this in a bag and and try to get the fluff away from them all. So that's kind of the reason I'm showing you. Timing is everything. But definitely wait for those seeds to be brown. This one I just throw in just because I think it's gorgeous. So this is the this is a ripe showy milkweed seed, which are just totally amazing. And everyone has their own little parachute. So I like to go up to the top of the little mountain up above the, the zoo and, and let the wind just carry them all over because they'll fly like crazy, but amazing little things. Um, now, I, I talk about, you know, Mother Nature doing her job. Well, that's great if we have plenty of cold winter and plenty of moisture, because these are really thick seeds. Milkweed seeds are really hard to germinate because of that, because they're so tight so strong and so we put them through a process called cold stratification which really kind of mimic mimics what nature used to do or you know we, we even make it more effective and all the, all it means is you simply take a spray bottle spray your entire paper towel and i've been doing this every night this week it's a good time for it sprinkle your seeds single layer fold the other half over it so you've got a little sandwich you know, get up to 10 of these guys and put them in, seal them in a baggie, label them, and they go in the fridge for 30 to 60 days. And then we're just mimicking again. We're just mimicking what nature does. Um, it just sounds scary. It looks kind of overwhelming, but it's really not. And then what you have is, you know, two months from now or 45 days from now, when it's time to start growing these guys indoors, you pull them out, put that, without even opening the baggie, put that baggie in a warm, sunny window or on a heating pad, and within you know, a couple of days, almost all of your seeds will germinate. So you at least know that you're starting with viable seeds. And this is amazing, because if you leave that bag just sitting out, that milkweed will grow, and these roots will, the, the tap root will be you know, six inches long. They just continue to grow on the damp paper towel. You don't want mold to get in there, and that's what's happening in some of these spots. But so that's how, that's the, you have the highest rate of success for germination if you'll use that process. And it really just takes untouched 30 to 60, 30, 45 days in a fridge, just stick it in, leave them in there. And when you're ready to pot it, to start them indoors, pull them out, warm them up, put them in the soil and you're, and you're off and running. Um, for best practices, and we've gone through a lot of, I, we, my friends and I, a lot of trial and error. And we discovered that red plastic solo cups are not the way to go. Um, but you want to plant the seeds about a half, a quarter to a half an inch deep. You need a good tall pot. So, uh, you know, three or four inches tall would be good if you're not starting them in the little peat pods first. But then put them in a peat cup or a biodegradable one that can dissolve in the ground because these guys, the, the tap root, they send down one root, and that tap root is what enables milkweed to be so drought tolerant. But it also is tricky to transplant just because, um, you know, you don't want to have it white, 
you just want it in good shape when you transplant. So we've really learned over the last six or eight years that it's best to just to put them in biodegradable or the peat cups, bury the whole thing in the ground, maybe poke your finger up in the bottom to make sure the root goes out. Um, and then you do want to water them in, in the first year. They're drought tolerant after they're established, but right now it's like putting in a tomato seed. You, you really have to treat them with care. And I even put them in with, you know, organic potting soil. I've really, you know, if you do that, you'll be surprised at the results you get. A lot of people will leave, also will leave one seed per cup. And I like to do, you know, three to five because for monarchs, it takes a certain mass for them to, for the milkweed to get their attention. That's, uh, Monarch Watch says that's at least 10 stems. So that means then I can hand somebody three of these cups and they've got the milkweed part covered. They just need to add flowers to that pitcher. And this is what happens after six weeks with grow lights. You can see that they're in pretty good shape. This is the showy milkweed. Um, now, what do you wanna do with it? So this is my backyard. This is that um, tuberose of the butterfly weed, the orange one that's native to St. George, which does absolutely fine in a yard up here. In fact, um, the Marmalade Library in just on like 5th North and 3rd West has landscaped with this all around their property. Um, this is in Salt Lake where we've got commercial landscapers are starting to mix in a little bit of milkweed. So you wouldn't even as a passerby realize that they're doing this for the monarchs, but then you've got the whole uh, smorgasbord, if you will. The monarch can come in, she'll see the color to feed off of, realize that there's milkweed there, lay eggs, and the whole, you know, she's got the complete ecosystem as long as she's got a little water somewhere. Here's a picture on Wasatch Boulevard and somebody has just turned their entire parking strip into showy milkweed. So it really, you have to kind of think ahead. Do you have a big space? Do you have a small space? Um, I actually had a local Zurich designer, Liz Hay, designed this for me. I just got it a week or two ago. And this is for a pretty big chunk of land. You could do it on, you know, the dead side of my house would be perfect, 24 feet by nine. And she's actually picked Zeric everything. Um, the showy milkweed is in there. The other, the orange butterfly weed is in there. And then she's picked things that will go across seasons and also says, you know, consider using, um, if you've ever used the Rocky Mountain bee plant, it is an amazing pollinator attractor and it's super fun to throw if, if you can get, give it a little bit of water and some sun. But um, so we've got some plans available, but here I am, this is probably five years ago. I had dead space on the north side of my house, decided to take out the sod. I've got tomatoes down there and turn this into monarch waste station. So I've got milkweed, milkweed, and I've got some you know, different plants. And back here, you don't really see it, but I've got a little terracotta dish that's plastic, not really terracotta, filled with river stones and it can catch water. And that's the water source that's required if you're gonna do this monarch waste station. So, you know, this is the way it started. This is 30 days later and you can see it just takes off. And now I have the most spectacular, it was just dead space. And I, I can guarantee you, I can get monarchs here every year, even now when it's such a bad season. Cause I, I got 70 eggs out of that side yard in the first year. You know, if, if you're crazy enough to go out and find them, you have to beat the other bugs to them. Otherwise they work their way through their life cycle in your garden. Um, and then I did go through Barnock Watch and, and make the commitment of no pesticides and I will keep it healthy and, and clean and such. And then we take it, we've done some bigger projects. This is in between, this is if, you, if you're familiar with Research Park by the Hogle Zoo the post office, that there's a place called Matheson Nature Preserve in between the post office and this is the place. And so we've gone in here and you can see we backfill with good potting soil, but we brought in milkweed. Then I sprinkled wildflower, native wildflower seeds. And it doesn't look like much, but over the course of the season, you know, we get monarchs laying eggs in here and all sorts of pollinators in here. So some of them are formal looking, some of them are just kind of out here in the wild, just trying to show you some examples. This is one of my most favorite. Um, Salt Lake City Corp jumped on board and allowed me to start putting in both some of the showy desert, you know, the drier looking 
milkweed up here with the rabbit brush, but also they had all these little streams that are feeding into the pond. And so we brought those plants up from American Fork, the seeds that were down in that amazing area. And you look, this is 2009, and this is what happens to it a year later. We had breeding, we had this male monarch that stayed for six weeks, and this is male and female. Um, we were so successful that he stayed all, you know, most of the summer. We got more bees than you can imagine. And I even have a video of a hummingbird taking nectar from a milkweed blossom. So if you build it, I swear they, they will come. Um, oh, I didn't know I had that in there twice. My apologies. So just some of the other things in, in kind of closing. We need to provide them breeding habitat, you know, milkweed and nectar flowers. We want to avoid using pesticides and herbicides around your plants because that stuff stays in the soil forever. You want to engage the next generation. God bless them. <laughs> and then you can get involved. You, you can get involved and you can see this little guy has a tag on him. We actually tag monarchs for the migration season. Um, the other thing that you can do, you know, again, create your own monarch way station. Some of them are prettier than others. This is how I mentioned that I created a little plastic terracotta dish that has just river rock in it. You see this irrigation line? It's just dripping into it. So you've got, I've got hornets, I've got bees, I've got butterflies, birds drinking out of it. So this is just out here in the wild that they've let me run a little water drip to that line but so that's one way to be helpful is create that in your yard or in your neighborhood park and then one of the fun things one of the fun projects we can do and how i originally got so involved was yeah you can actually tag a monarch and this is down in american fork at that property i mentioned and this was the last day of august 2019 and we tagged a male monarch and released him and he traveled from American Fork to Pismo Beach, and January 3rd, a volunteer on their end found him. He was happily mating. He was doing well, so here's that same tag that's got a phone, it's got a website and a number that they can call and say, hey, we just found your monarch. And so in Utah, we've had now six or eight of them found that have crossed the Sierra Nevadas, that have gone all the way to Phoenix on their way, have gone out to Vernal heading to Phoenix. And so there's a Many, many, many have been tagged across the nation that people are just, you know, finding out more about the journey. But that is one thing that every citizen, if you wanted to get involved, I can help you with that. It's, it's an amazing thing, and you wouldn't think that they could fly, but they just take off with it. It's, it's just a tiniest, light little label. So fun. And then the other thing, again, you know, I've been doing this in my neighborhood when I'm raising some for teaching, I get the neighborhood kids involved and they all came over one day and we all tagged the monarchs. And you, you wonder if you make a difference with these kids, even though they're there and they're paying attention. But I come home from work a couple of days later and here's this note stuck to my front door. And, you know, dear Mrs. Taylor, the Nelsons and I found a monarch butterfly that has not been tagged. We are keeping it in a bin to give to you. Please come to my house. And these guys, it made such an impression on them. I went over, they had it in a cardboard box with a blanket over it. That poor monarch was not getting away. And we tagged it and released it. And it's just, you can make a difference if you get these kids, if you show them just the magic. And then the magic comes back to me. You can see I'm stuck on my front door. Because really, if we have no milkweed, we have no monarchs. All right. Thanks, Rachel, for the presentation. That was great. Learned a lot. Um, we've got some questions coming in for you. You bet. Um, the first one is, I have several showy milkweed plants in my West Jordan backyard along a fence, but I haven't seen any monarchs, on, caterpillars on them. Do I need to do more to attract them? Well, it would two things come to mind. It would be helpful if there are there flowers around because the, the bloom is going to happen probably in late May and June. So that will attract them. But it also, like the rest of the season, 
you know, if you have other flowers near them, that would be an attractor. And also just the sheer fact that you're not watching out the window, you know, uh, all the time. And remember that a lot of them get picked off and eaten until they get big. And then the birds will actually throw up if they eat them. So we're not dealing with a huge amount of numbers right now. So they're, they're kind of between the two. They need, they need more, they need food and they, uh, we're, we're pretty slim right now. Okay. Um, have you tried planting the milkweed seeds in the fall rather than the artificial stratification? Yeah, and you definitely can throw them out in the fall. Um, I think that, or throw them in a pot. If you're afraid of them spreading, which the showy one will spread, you can, you can put them in a pot and they'll, they will do just fine. Uh, it's just that they're, it's not, even with a good snowy year, it's not as effective as as starting them yourself because even if you throw them out your car window, which I've done all over the place, um, they have to connect with dirt. They have to get water. I mean, there's things have to be just right. And so the, yeah, it, it'll work, but just not quite as effective as you would think it would. Sounds good. Uh, this next question is about a water source for them. Uh, if you give them a water source, does it need to be still or um, does a stream nearby work? Stream nearby would be great. You know, if they can land on something, mine just happens to be this little bowl, but streams are what, you know, they follow as they're coming up through Utah. You know, they, they're going to follow the little rivers and the Jordan River is a great example of a riparian corridor where monarchs, where we're putting more milkweed along it. Okay, uh, the next question is about the seeds. Um, so um, some people have come to the garden and picked up some seeds, which we mm -hmm. still have some available. Um, the question is, when should they start the process with the seeds? I assume they're talking about the stratification. Mm -hmm. And just to give some background on the seeds, we have kept them in a fridge uh, at the garden for at least a month now. And so, uh, I start the process in about mid-February. So anytime from now to the end of February, if you're going to start them indoors, because I like to start them early April so that they have six weeks growth and I can plant them outside after Mother's Day. So really just give yourself at least six weeks on the damp paper towel in the fridge and you can either time that so you wanna just plant those seeds outside once it's safe to do it, or if you wanna start them indoors. You kind of want to work on that right now to get them into the fridge. Okay, um, and here's another one. Uh, any idea on how much moisture is needed for the swampy milkweed? Yes, I, I got to tell you, I love it. I have it in my yard. It does get a little bit of water twice a week just on what's left of the, the grass out there. It's not like it needs to be planted on the side of a, you know, a little stream. It does absolutely fine. Um, once it's established, you know, I could get away with maybe a little bit of water once or twice a week. And it's not a spreader. Okay, where, that's where good. Where the other one is, yeah. Okay. And it comes up, really, it comes up as a bush as opposed to the other ones that come up single stems and will spread. Sounds good. Um, maybe a spot someone could locate the swamp milkweed is... Uh, in a planting bed, maybe next to their lawn too, because it might get some of that yep. over spray yeah. uh, from the lawn. So um, the next question is, are there instructions on how to set up the way station somewhere? I think you rest referenced the way yes, station. Yes, absolutely. You can either go to Monarch Watch's website or here's, here's an easier one. If you have Facebook, we have a group called Monarchs of the Wasatch and in there, there's a files section. You know, it has media, it has all the different options at the top. Under the files, I have the document in there from Monarch Watch, and the, the requirements are simply 10 stems of milkweed. You know, you need to have the flowers to go with it, no pesticides, and some kind of water source, even if that's just a little butterfly dish. Sounds good. Um, this next one's about a, the bird population that might be around their yard. Mm -hmm. Is, are birds dangerous to the monarch caterpillars? To the little ones, yeah, okay. they are. Okay. Not the big ones, because they know that they get sick and that's why they're so brightly colored. Okay. Um, I, the next question's about the water source again. 
Uh, mm -hmm. I guess there's concerns about mosquitoes in the water source. Have you experienced anything with that? Yeah, and I'm just talking like a little bowl that you could squirt out daily or that in the heat of the summer actually dries out by the end of the day. Okay. So it's not like you're going to put a big tub. See, mine, mine is like a pie plate. That sounds so, good. Yeah, it'll dry out by the end of the day. There is one more thing that I forgot to mention, and the woman that said she has uh, milkweed out on the back side of her yard, that what people don't realize is that monarchs will look for the tiniest, freshest growth. And, and in patches of milkweed, that can be the little new growth on the end. And they will lay eggs on plants that are even two inches tall. So they're going to look for the newest, freshest plants. So when you're looking for your monarchs, you don't necessarily need to dive into the, the big, tall plants. Look at that new growth. And in fact, on July 1st of every year, I cut down half of my milkweed to the ground because it'll send up all these new little fresh sprouts and offer new, new growth.